Goodbye. Okay, we are doing Renew by the Spirit part. not even there yet. We would just start at six, right? Because in that, it's 37 is Satan's strategies and attacks. So we did start six. All right. And then the last thing you have is Joel. Joel? What was the question? No, I have... Okay, recap. Okay, study six, the stakes are high. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that you're the one leading the class. God, I ask, Lord, that you will have your way, that the Holy Spirit will just take its place and teach us and bring us new revelation and new insight. So, Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you for today. In Jesus' name, study six, the stakes are high. We have seen that we were created to, to love God, to worship him, and to live for him. And when we reconcile to God, the Father, through his son, Jesus, we are able to fulfill these purposes as we reach out to others so that they, too, may be reconciled to him and receive all the blessing he desires to give them. Yet Satan wants to destroy every person on earth in whatever ways he can, the stakes in the spiritual warfare are the highest. They involve both the state of the people's lives on earth and their internal destinies. The wonderful news is that the mercy of God has provided healing and deliverance from spiritual forces from the darkness through Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, 16 says, The people who sat in the darkness have seen great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Although we live in a day of great trouble, of spiritual deception, we also have great deliverer who frees the captives. Let us acknowledge what is at stake for us and others as we work alongside God to free those who the enemy has taken captive and oppressed. Okay, the, script, the scripture for this one is, the spirit, of, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty liberty to the captives and recover the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed that's luke chapter 4 18. what terms did jesus and the apostle paul use for satan in revelation the present world that was like i think that's where we ended up at Oh, okay, I see where we were. All right. We're at number eight, where it says, Who will be condemned at the end of age? Joel chapter 3, verse 12. That's where we ended up at. So, Joel chapter 3, verse 12. Chapter 3, verse 12, right? Yeah, 12 to 14. It says, Joel chapter 3, 
verse 12 says, Let the nations be called to arms. Let them march to the valley of Jasaphat. There I, the Lord, will sit to pronounce judgment on them all. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the grapes, for the wine press is full. The storage vats are overflowing with the wickedness of these people. Thousands upon thousands are waiting in the valley of decision. There, are, there the, do, the day of the Lord will soon arrive. So it says, who will be condemned at the end of age? Obviously the wicked. It says that the nations be called to arms. Let them march to the valley of Jasper. There I, the Lord, will sit to pronounce judgment on them all. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread the grapes, for the wine press is full. The storage vats are overflowing with the wickedness of these people. Let me see something. I'm going to take a deeper look into that for one minute. Let's see. Joel 312. Let the pagan nations set out for Judgment Valley. There I'll take my place at the bench and judge all the surrounding nations. Swing, swing the sickle, the harvest is ready. Stomp on the grapes, the wine press is full. The wine vats are full, overflowing with vintage, vintage evil. Mass confusion, mob uproar in the decision of Valley. God's judgment day has arrived in Decision Valley. That's the, the message. All right, what's the next question? Let's go to Revelation 20, verse 14. Revelation 20, verse 14. It says, then death, then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So basically, it was saying, it's saying, who will be condemned at the end of age? Those who are not in the book of life. The next question is, even though Satan is temporarily allowed to work his darkness on the earth, who ultimately rules over the nations of the world? Go to 2 Chronicles verse 20, chapter 20, verse 6. Yeah, it says, even though Satan is temporarily, temporarily allowed to work his darkness on earth, who ultimately rules over the nations of the world? Second Chronicles, uh, to, uh, chapter 20, verse 6. Verse 6, who's going to read that? 
when I get there. So um go down to seven. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and who gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham your friend? It said okay. It said He prayed. O oh Lord God, our, our of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people of Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your fr friend Abraham? So... Even though Satan is temporarily allowed, temporarily allowed to work his darkness on earth, God ultimately rules over every nation. See that there's a there's a plan, there's a purpose and a plan, and that's that's God's strategy. Like He's just temporarily allowing, being allowed to do this, but He doesn't. He's not even. He's gonna do as much as he can, but it doesn't mean that he's a winner. <laughs> doesn't mean he's the winner. All right, let's go to um, the next one. Says let's list three aspects of God's ultimate plan for the earth. Ooh, this is a Hab Habakkuk, 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 Habakkuk. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> have a it, have a go, have a go. <laughs> it's an Old Testament. <laughs> uh, what can you do? Once we remove the Spanish accent, I think we can work it out. 1843, and we're doing chapter 2, verse 14. What is it? 2.14. You want to read that? Joe. Okay, 2.14. 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That was it? 2.14, right? Okay. Three, list three aspects of God's ultimate plan on earth. For as the water fills the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. Okay. So, number one. Is what? The earth will be filled with an awareness of the Lord's glory which is, I believe, is happening right now. So number two, go to Luke chapter 11, verse two. Eleven two. Okay. 
and says this three aspects of God's ultimate plan for the earth. And Luke chapter 2, B, because there's, you see how, okay, so I can explain it really quick. You see how number two, it says, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy, that's A. B is, may your kingdom come soon. So it says, Luke chapter 2, B is that. So the second aspect is that may, that his kingdom will come soon. So that's number two. And then number three, go to Revelation 11, 15. Eleven fifteen. Okay, again, so it's chapter 11, verse 15b, which would be, and he will reign forever. So it says, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and our his Christ, and that he will reign forever. So the, the third plan for earth, God's ultimate plan for earth is that he will reign forever. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the next one. Okay. What is God's attitude towards those who are currently living under the power of the devil according to the sinful nature? Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Let's see, because God has an attitude. It says, what is God's attitude? Sorry. Towards those who are currently living under the power of the devil according to a sinful nature. So let's see. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Okay, it says Mark chapter 2, verse 17. What is God's attitude towards those who are currently living under the power of the devil and, uh, and according to the sinful nature? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. So what's God's attitude? Mm -hmm. He didn't come for the healthy people. He came for those who are sick. He came to heal and to deliver them. Okay. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. Any yep. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Let's go down to 10. But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in the fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Okay, let's go down to 11. 
since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives sh you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. Okay, next one. What does God want to do for those who are in jeopardy of eternal death? Go to Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Three, one to five. Yeah. Look at this. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime? No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Its leaders are like roaring lions hunting for their victims. Its judges are like ravenous wolves at evening time who by dawn have left no trace of their prey. If prophets are ignorant liars seeking their own gain, its priests defile the temple by disobeying God's instructions. But the Lord is still there in the city and he does no wrong. Day by day, he hands down justice, and he does not fail, but the wicked know no shame. I'm gonna go down. I have wiped out many nations, devastating their fortress walls and towers. Their streets are now deserted. Their cities lie in a silent ruin. There are no survivors, none at all. I thought surely they will have reverence for me by now. I am in Zachariah. Chapter 3, what's the Mm-hmm. Let me check. <laughs> there it goes on. Yes. Oh, no. It was still good, though. It was good. <laughs> Yo, it was still on, it was still on point. Sephaniah. Oh. <laughs> I went to Sephaniah, but look at this. It says unchanging God. We must know some practical truths that applies to believers today. First, God judges his people when they deliberately disobey his law. His people are to be different from the other nations and not imitate their ways or worship their gods. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. It is abomination for all believers today. Second, God promises to Abraham still stands. Those who bless Israel, God will bless. Those who curse Israel, God will curse. The nations that have sinned against God by mistreating the Jews can expect him to judge them. Now finally, God's word is true and will be fulfilled in its time. God's people can claim his promises and know that their God will be faithful, and God's enemies can be sure that his words of warning carry costly penalties. It is terrible, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, now I'll go to Zechariah. <laughs> but it was it still is it's talking about the eternal death. That's okay, that was Holy Spirit Lag. 1968. Okay, now it's the that was the book before Haggy, so now we're here. And we're going to chapter three. All right. Chapter three. Cleansing for the high priest. It says 
Then the angel showed me Yeshua, the highest priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, here's the Old Testament. Yeshua in, in Hebrew means Jesus. So look what he's saying. The angel of the Lord showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Joshua, 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 Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, take off his filthy clothes. And, and turning to Joshua, he said, see, I have taken away your sins, and now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Then I said, they should also place a clean tur turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. This is like this is like the prophecy. This is exactly what happened on Calvary. This is a prophetic moment that just came to pass. Remember, the things already in, on earth are a shadow of what is going on in heaven and what's come to pass. If you actually sit down and read that, you will actually realize that that's exactly what happened at the cross of Calvary. The filthy sin was removed, and he was now placed as high priest. So he says the filthy, what, okay, Joshua's clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the others standing there, take off your filthy clothes. And turning to Joshua, he said, see, I've taken away your sins and I'm giving you the fine new clothes. That's also something prophetic that he speaks over to the believers. He takes away your sins and now he gives you clothes of a high priest. And he places a clean turbine. That's that thing that goes over your head. So they put on a, a, a clean priestly one over his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Joshua and said, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyards. And I will let you walk among these others standing here. I mean, you can go on. Look what it says. Listen to me, O Joshua, the high priest, and all you other priests. You are symbols. Look, you are symbols of things to come. Okay, he's already he's already telling them this. What I'm doing is all symbolic to what's about to come through my son. Then look what he says. Soon I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. Now look at the jewel I have set before you, Joshua. A single stone with seven, with seven facet, what? facets, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord of heaven's army, and I will remove the sins of this land in a single day. And on that day, says the Lord of heaven armies, each of you will invite your neighbors to sit with you peacefully under your own grapevine and fig tree. Come on. This is the Old Testament. And he's already, see, because God's word has to come to pass. So God had to speak this so that it will come to pass. And he said it one single day. So here's this man with this name, exactly how his son will be named, okay? And he's doing some, oh, Jesus. He's doing symbolic things to this person. And he's going to use the symbol to bring something to come to pass. He does the same with us. See, everything was already won. Now, he, grabbed, he, he builds up this army. That's us. He builds up this army, and everybody has their position, okay? And then he, he puts generals, he puts banners, he puts this, he puts that on, he puts a turbine, he puts that. And he says, now, this is what you'll do, because I need this to come to pass. So this already passed. Now we have our 
position where we need to bring things to come to pass. Imagine how many symbols that he, he puts before us, how many things that he's made symbolic that we catch with our eyes that we're like, whoa, there's too many sevens. You know, like stuff like that. Like there's too many times, like I can see a peacock how many times in a month. And I'm like, okay, that's symbolic. And come to find out, we saw in prayer night that that was symbolic. It's in the Bible. It was in the Bible as a symbolic thing. So God still is the same as he was then. He's still the same now. Before, okay, next one, let's go. Before we were saved through faith in Christ, what did we live according to? And what were we by nature? Ephesians chapter 2, 1 and 3. Okay, Ephesians 2. Oh, all right. I'm tired today because of the heat wave. <laughs> but I always figure I'm taking up a notch. Come on. Two. Give me one, two, three. You were dead in the trespasses and sins, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Okay, that's mm. was going to go Okay, um, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 3. <laughs> once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. Here's the spirit at work in our hearts of those who refuse to obey God. See what he does? Look what it says. He works our hearts because he knows that God is the God of our hearts. So how better way to get through to somebody but than to play with their heart? <clears throat> he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Okay? So it says, before we were saved through faith in Christ, we were also living according to dead, the death, according to disobedience, according to, to our sinful nature, disobeying God and obeying God. The devil and who else did it say? Having passionate desires of sinful nature. Okay. But there was something I wanted to show you. Okay. It would be profitable for us to review what the first three chapters of Ephesians have taught us about this glorious unlimited resource with which God empowers us. True riches come from God. That's number one. It is a source of great encouragement to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all working on our behalf to make me rich. God not only richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment, in 1st Timothy chapter 6 17 but he gives us eternal riches without which all other wealth is valueless in Christ you and I have what money can't buy and these spiritual riches open up to us all the wealth of God's vast creation and we enjoy the gifts because we know and love the giver check out number two all of these riches come by God's grace and for God's glory we often have the idea that God saves sinners mainly because he pities them or wants to rescue them from eternal judgment. But God, but God's main purpose is that he might be glorified. His creation reveals his wisdom and power, but his church reveals his love and grace. You cannot deserve or earn these spiritual riches. You can only receive them by grace through your faith. 
And the last one, these riches are only the beginning. There's always more spiritual wealth to claim from the Lord as we walk with him. The Bible is our guidebook. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And as we search the word of God, we discover more and more of the riches we have in Christ. These riches are planned by the Father, purchased by the Son, and presented by the Spirit. So, the riches are what? Planned by God, purchased by Jesus, and presented by the Spirit. There is really no, one, no need for us to live in poverty when all of God's wealth is at our disposal. So planned by the Father, purchased by the Son, and then it's presented by the Spirit. That's why it's so important to have all three. You have to have the Trinity. It's just, you can't have one and the other and not have it because you're not going to have the completeness or the fullness of what we are supposed to reach in Christ. So those are our unlimited resources. We have to now learn how to tap into unlimited resources. Because it says right here that God gives us unlimited resources from the, according to the first three chapters of Ephesians. All right. What did God do for us in his mercy and love? It's found in Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 8. What did God do for us in his mercy and love? It says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you, God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of an incredible wealth of grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do good things he planned for us long ago. What does Satan do to human beings through his demons? Mark chapter 9, verse 14. Mark chapter 9, 14 and 22. Okay. All of a sudden, when the whole house saw him, they were amazed and ready to reach him. Then he asked, he asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Out of, out of the crowd, one man answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him money and his feet. Wherever it sees his hand, it throws him down, and he pulls at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to drive him out to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring him to me. 
So they brought him to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately convulsed con- 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 the boy. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foam- foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said, and many times they have thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if he can do anything, have compassion on him and help us. Wow. It says, what does Satan do to human beings through his demons? So here you can see that the story of the boy, he he actually possessed his body. It says, Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. So he caught a seizure. And then he fell to the ground, foaming at the mouth. How long has has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into a fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. <laughs> oh, they seem to miss that part. It said, he said, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried, I believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. Ah. Oh, we're not going to do this, Holy Spirit. He says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. What happened there? He says, I do believe, but yet I'm asking you to help me overcome my unbelief. He believes, he just doubts in what? In miracles? In healing and deliverance. Uh huh. Like they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe, but they doubt the miracles. They doubt the healing. They doubt the deliverance. So when you go to ask for healing, you're not going to get it because it says anything is possible for a person who believes, not doubts. So you, you really have to believe that Jesus is the same as yesterday, today, and forever. That he is going to make, he does the same miracles, like turning water into wine. He does the same miracles of delivering this boy right here. He does the same miracles casting out demons. He does the same miracles healing the sick, the paralyzed. So if you really do believe that he does that today, then you shouldn't have a problem imparting healing onto somebody that needs healing but if you see that you're saying I believe and every time you go to pray sometimes it's just you, your doubt that holds you back from being able to deliver healing when Jesus saw the crowd of crowd of onlookers was growing he rebuked the evil spirit listen you spirit that that makes you listen you spirit that makes the boy unable to hear and speak I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. What an authority. What an authority to tell him to come out and he can never go in there again. Some people say come out, but they never say don't ever come back. (laughs) It's authority. So what does Satan what does Satan do to his human beings to his demons? He uses them. He uses their body, uses their mind, he paralyzes them, he makes them sick. He gives them sicknesses. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 26. He inflicts them. He causes infliction. Okay, and here's another one. So, they arrived to the region of... Oh, come on. Across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, 
a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time, he had been homeless and naked, living in a cemetery outside of town. He was homeless, naked, and living in a cemetery. I'm on, on 8, verse 26. Luke 8, 26. So they arrived in the region across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came to meet him. For a long time he had been homeless, naked, and living in a cemetery. As soon as he saw Jesus, he fell down in front of him, and then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. Out of him. The spirit had often taken control of this man, even when he placed under guard and put in chains and shackles, he simply broke them and rushed into the wilderness completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs. See, Jesus already told him to come out. And then he started saying, but why are you interfering with what I'm doing? Like, why, why are you here? So if you're here to cast us out, I know other versions says it's, it's not even time. Other versions say it's not time. You know, but he's saying here, why are you here? Why are you interfering? And, and Jesus is like, you know what? What's your name? Yeah. And he says, Legion, there's so many of us. He goes, get out and go into, you know, go into the herds of pigs and they go. And they jump in where? To the river, to the ocean. So Jesus gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And they entered the whole herd, plunged down to a steep hill into the lake and drowned. So again, we see that Satan uses human beings to possess them. Okay, what did the demons recognize about Jesus? Luke 4, 33. Okay, another one. The question is, what did demons recognize about Jesus? Once when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, began shouting at Jesus, Go away! Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus cut him short, be quiet and come out of that man. He ordered at that time at that the demon threw the man to the floor as the crowd watched and then it came out of him without hurting him further. Amazed the people exclaimed, What authority and power this man this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him and they flee at his command. The news about Jesus spread through the entire village. In the what is it says? Every village in the entire region. So what does demons recognize about Jesus? Right. And who has the authority and power? Be quiet and come out of that man, he ordered. Okay, let's go to the next one. What did demons recognize about themselves when confronted by Jesus? Go to Matthew chapter 8, 29. Matthew chapter 8, 29. What did demons recognize about themselves when confronted by Jesus? Here it is. Now, this is the same one we read in, Ch in Luke. We are now seeing in Matthew's. Obviously, Matthew adds in more. Maybe Luke does, does it real briefly, but Matthew goes into detail. And he says, 
they began screaming at him, Why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to, to torture us before God's appointed time? So they know. They know. It says, what did demons recognize about themselves when they're confronted by Jesus? They know that there's a time coming for them. There's an appointed time coming for them where it's going to end for them. That's why they work, 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 and never stop working. Because they don't know what time it is. When is it going to be? So they have to work, work, work. They never rest. If they don't rest, then we don't rest. Because if how are we going to rest when they're, they're not people? They don't rest. Their spirits don't rest. They never sleep. Okay. It says, list various aspects of Jesus' stated mission on earth. John 10.10. 10. John 10, 10. John 10, 10. 10, 10 news. The question is, list various aspects of John. I mean, list various aspects of Jesus' stated mission on earth. What's his mission? What was his day? What is his aspects of mission? So John ten ten. What is it saying? To kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So his mission on earth is to give life and to give it in abundance. Go to Luke chapter 4, 18. Another aspect. Luke 4, 18. Okay, come on. 4, 18. All right, his mission to bring the good news to release the captives, give sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. All right. Now the last one. Uh, go to 1910. Stay in Luke. 1910. It says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. You see what it says there, though? Seek and then save those who are lost. It doesn't say that they're going to come. <laughs> so you got to go out there and seek them. Seek them, save them. Because they're lost. <laughs> oh, a bunch of sleepy crowd today. <laughs> Next, give some examples of how Jesus fulfilled his mission. Matthew 8, verse 16. Eight, 
Give, give some examples of how Jesus fulfilled his mission. Look what it says. What did it say? 16, 17. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said he took our sicknesses and removed our disease. <laughs> so... Some examples. Casted out evil spirits and healed the sick. If you go to Matthew 11, 4 to 5. Says 11, 4 to 5. Says, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the leapers are cured. The deaf hear, the dead, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. That's another thing that he did. That's all stuff he did right there. Look what he said. The blind see, the lame walk, the leapers, the leopards are cured. The leapers. <laughs> The deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached. God blesses those who do not turn away from because of me. So though, that's, 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 that, if you ever ask what's your purpose, what's your calling, that's it right there. To be on a mission. To what? So that the blind can see, the lame can walk, the leapers can be cured, the deaf can hear, and the dead will rise. And don't forget to preach the good news. Obviously, when they come, it's because of the, the truth, the conviction of the truth to bring them there. All right. What's... um. All right, go to Luke chapter 19, 1, 9. Somebody read that. Yeah, chapter 19, 1 to 9. He entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named um, Zacchaeus. Zacharias. Zacharias, who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was no. No, that's not Zacharias. All right. We're going to start using our pronunciation app. <laughs> really. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I'm going to stay at your house. So he, so he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw, all who saw it began to complain. He's gone to, he's gone to lodge with a simple man. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor Lord. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times so as much. Today, today's salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus. 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 Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus. 
website, Zacchaeus. Well, we're going to learn these names, aren't we? It's <laughs> Zacchaeus. All right, well, what's the question? It says, what was, okay, so what was the mission? What was the mission in one of nine? Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Zacchaeus. I like it too. Alright, what's our next question? Give some examples of how Jesus, okay, we did that. To whom did Jesus entrust the con continue continuation of this mission? Luke 9, 1 to 6. Oh, you still didn't finish? Yeah. Wait, why is it going all the way to nine? The question is, to whom did Jesus entrust the continuation of this mission? It's one to six. He entrusted disciples. Says if a town refuses to welcome you, shake all, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. Okay. Let's go to chapter 10. Stay in Luke. Go to verse 1. Yeah. Now, now, look who else he entrusted. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. So there you got 72 now. Now go to Mark 16. And verse 14 to 18. Still, later, he appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together, and he rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. And they will speak a new language. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it will not hurt them. And they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. That's even for believers that don't believe that they have the power to heal. That no, it says it here. Is he a liar or is he speaking the truth? Because I'm looking at it, it's in red. Anything that's red is exactly what he said. So, is Jesus a liar or 
is he saying the truth? Go into all the world, preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany them. They will cast out demons in my name. And they will speak a new language. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink any poison, it won't hurt them. And they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. That's how you can ask yourself, do I really believe and am I really saved? Go out there and test it. Put your hands on someone who's sick. What does it say? Cast some, a demon out of somebody who has one. What does it say? Don't, I'm not going to tell you to go drink poison because I'm. that's not, you're testing the Lord now. It says just in case you end up drinking poison. You speak in new languages. That's the gifts of tongues. And I was thinking about that today when I was sitting. I'm like, there was times over and over again where they said that some can get the gifts of tongues and some can't. And, I, and, and deep in me, something said, that's not true. All can get the gift of tongues. Bob Jones. Right. This generation has it good, but I don't. I think that they could have had it before too. But don't forget that 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 you know every generation was limited. It was like stricter, stricter, and stricter until like you know prayer, perseverance, endurance started to bring them out of their restrictions. So, and you can get utterance, which means you can, your tongues can switch. You can have different speaking of tongues, which happens to me, and I've heard it, like in other people. And but the Bible does say you can have different. It's called utterance. It can switch. I'm reading into that a little deeper to see why that happens, because I want to know. Because obviously God, you know, switches them for a reason. Like when I first started, they were a lot different. Yeah. So what if it's what if it's changing because you're in a different season? You know, it's not. It's. <clears throat> I would love that the person who has the gift of interpreting will go ahead and rise up and receive her gift of interpreting so that that can unify and we can actually really know when the Lord wants to say something that we will have somebody who would say it. Yeah, no, I love it when that happens in a church. It, you can feel the power of God. But you know... Anyway, I ain't pointing no fingers to Jada. What business? The one that you don't want to like come in? The couple of God's business? Don't even. It's great. I love it. It's, it's their witnesses now. Huh? Whatever. Moving on. To whom did Jesus entrust? Okay, so we did that. How did the disciples and other believers carry on Jesus' mission after he returned to God the Father in heaven? Mark chapter 16, 19, 20. Oh, we're still right there on the same page. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up to heaven and sat in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord walked through them. Oh, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Confirming. Always confirming. God is always confirming. Always confirming. More than three times. <laughs> He's just a big 
proud of confirmation. <laughs> All right. So that was Mark. Um, let's go to the books of Acts. Let's do chapter two. And wowzers. They want one to 41. Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost all the believers were meeting together in one place there goes that word suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout, devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they would be wild to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They explained. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking our own native language. Here we are, and then he talks about all the different types of nationalities that are sitting amongst them. Let's go down to 10, 11. We all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Hmm. How interesting. They were filled with other languages of these people's nation. So let's say you're Spanish, uh, African, uh, everything, any nation that speaks another language. They get filled with the Holy Ghost and they all start speaking a different language from this culture. And each one of them can understand what they're saying. We all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. And they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? But others in the crowd Ridicule them saying they're just drunk. That's all Hmm, you're talking about people That are not like someone who's not Spanish Someone who's not African Some someone who's not native Indian someone who I'm just Caucasian speaking native Indian I'm just um, African speaking to you in Spanish So you got all this type of people understanding what they're saying, and they're all saying the good things of God. You know what's so crazy? That today I was listening to something, a sermon, and this guy was talking about how this lady came for help, and she was being possessed, and she needed help because she was, it was becoming physical. She was getting bite marks, whatnot, anyway. So he goes to her house and he starts to do the deliverance and she starts speaking in tongues in a native language that she does not speak. He called someone he knows that's a, a doctor with like the highest pH you can get. He studied all his life ancient languages. He was, she was speaking an ancient language that he recognized and understood everything that she was saying. So God gives us native languages. And they say it's right that you, your spirit, can understand. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes 
when you listen to yourself speaking a language, you can kind of like relate the dialect to another culture. And I ever always wonder like, when I have a certain tongue, it kind of sounds like I can be maybe in an African culture and they would probably understand. Now, imagine if I get in, into the, and then they hear my dialect, they're going to know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. And that would be amazing. To have, like, someone to interpret that, you know? Or then, let's say if it switches again, someone else in the room will be able to interpret, like, whoa, that's my native language. Because God created it. <laughs> so why wouldn't he know it? Why wouldn't he, someone else know it? Because he created it, why wouldn't someone else know it? That that's amazing. So this is like another another thing again. Like we have languages that someone else can understand. You know, besides our spirit. I mean, I, I'm if you would start practicing your language on your own time, and you keep doing that, you will start to know what the spirit is saying. Because the spirit will tell you. And you'll start to understand what the spirit is telling God about you, for you, encouraging you, lifting you. Because the Bible says it's mainly for you, unless the Lord uses you for the body of the kingdom to, to bring forth a message that's very urgent. He usually does that. And when that happens, I'm telling you it's not a joke. The whole room gets silent when you know the Lord is in the room. That's that's heavy. Heavy. So, I don't know. Those gifts of tongues, is the, it's a gift for a reason. And if you're not using them, you're wasting the gift. Seriously. I've been noticing a lot when it comes to spiritual growth that a lot of them, Smith Burger words, all those good ones, they, Charles Spurgeon, they all talk about praying in your native language, praying in your tongues. Yeah. And they talked about how much they grew in that and how much they started to understand it. I had this other one that I was listening to a teaching, and he says, do that for an hour a day in your prayer time, and you will begin to learn to interpret your own tongues. Boom. So, yeah, but even when, um, Smith, when I read his stuff, Sometimes he starts um, interpretation of tongues, and he'll tell you what he just interpreted out of his tongues. And you're like, wow, he did both. And that's because he spent his time in that language practicing. It's like Spanish. You're not good at it, but keep talking in it, and you'll get better at it. You know what I mean? It's practice. So... That was a quick little insight on that because we were in books of Acts. All right. Um, let's go on to the next question. Whom did Jesus say were his disciples? John 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful in my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Where are you going to find Jesus' teachings? Exactly, in the word. I like that, that you know, they responded... But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. We don't even have to keep going. That alone holds power. Because they looked at him and said, well, wait a minute. We're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. I'm sure Jesus was like, yeah. But because you don't understand what I mean, <laughs> and breaks it down, but... 
And look what it says. Go down to um, 39. Our father is Abraham, they declared. Jesus said, no. For if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitate. No, you are imitating your real father. Ay, 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 the double-edged sword. He knows how to pull that dagger. He's like, no, you're not imitating your father. Because Abraham would have never done that. But you're imitating your real father. Oh, man, Jesus just knew what the hearts were saying. That must have been, like, so hard for him to know all the time what your heart was saying. You know, like, he knew it. But because of that, he came with correction of love. And he just said it. You know, like, I know what you're thinking, but I'm going to help you out here. You know, others know what you're, supposedly what you're thinking and supposedly what they say is the truth, but they don't come out with correction or love. They come out with, with bitterness. And bitterness, I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to see that's really a bad, bad thing to have. It's actually demonic. It's actually demonic. Bitterness is an actual stronghold. And... It's crazy, but we're not going to get into that. Um, okay. What should we do today as disciples of Jesus Christ? John chapter 14, 15. It says, if you love me, obey my commands. Go to 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. But it says, if you love me, obey my commands. So that's what disciples should be doing today. If you love him. That's how you know if somebody really loves him or not. If you just don't obey. That That's, that's how I know. You can love him. But if you really, really loved him, you have, we have to know there's four different types of love. You have to know what type of love are you giving Jesus. Is it the agape love that God says that connects us to him? Because that's God's love. And because we love God, we love Jesus. Because we love Jesus, we love God. And because we love him, we're not disobeying him. We're not falling into, we're being good stewards of his word. Or are you in love with him as if you love the world? That'll never help you because you will always come against the world. You will always fall short and short of the glory of the world. So many times you have to ask yourself, where, how, where do you love him? How do you love him? Which part of the four loves do fall in place with Jesus? Because there is four types of love. Do you love him like that Gabby love though? The real love. Look them up. There's four of them. And you'll start to see the breakdown of four different ones. I'm not liking that fly. So, if you love me, you obey my commandments. That was John 14. Uh-huh, John 14, 15. What assures... What assurance do we have that God will keep us safe in him as we continue Jesus' mission in the world? John 17, 11. What assurance do we have? It says, now I'm departing from the world, and you are staying in this world. But I am coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united, just as we are. 
Look, 12 says, during my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now I'm coming to you, and I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so that they would be filled with my joy. And I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself a holy, as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through your message. I pray that they will, that they will be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such a perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do, and these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. He's just so amazing. Like, look how he speaks to, to God. Like, he speaks to his father with such a love and endurance. And it's like, there's so much love. Look how he starts. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. It's right there. It's in John, John 17. She's like, what was that? The whole thing is red. It's not red. You're either? Oh, no. We gotta upgrade. Why is it not red? Are you in John 17? Okay, did you see verse 6? Is it not red? Is it red? Look what it says. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world, and they were always yours. You give them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me, and they accepted it, and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those who you've given me. This is amazing. I could read this forever. And he's like, oh, righteous father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. Like, come on. It's like a child with his dad, you know? Like, oh, father, they don't believe in you, but I do. You know, they don't know you, but I do. They're not home when I'm home with you and see the good works you do, God. I mean, you could go on forever like a child. Like, it's like a, a son sitting on his father's lap and just going on and serenading his dad. Like, he knows that this is the time it's coming, you know? Um, this is it. He's a, As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is him in the garden? Yeah, the prayer of Jesus. And he's saying, I know the hour has come. And I know I'm going to die. But not really. You know? <laughs> I 
We're going to end it with this. The power of God's word. How does the word of God enable us to overcome the world? To begin with it, to begin with, it gives us joy. And this inward joy gives us strength to overcome. We commonly think of Jesus Christ as a man of sorrow. And indeed he was. But he was also a person of deep abiding joy. Is the very John 17, 13 is the very heart of his of this prayer. And its theme is joy. The word not only imparts the joy of the Lord, but it also assures us of his love. The world hates us, but we are able to confront this hatred with God's love. A love imparted to us by the Spirit through the word. The world hates us because we do not belong to its system and will not be conformed to its practices or standards. The world, word reveals to us what the world is really like. The word exposes the world's deception and dangerous devices. The word of God not only brings us God's joy and love, but it also imparts God's power for the holy living. The burden of the Lord's prayer from 6, six to 12 was security. But here's the, the sensity, practical holy living to the glory to the glory of God. We are in a world, but not of the world, and we must not live like the world. True sanctification, being set apart for God, comes through the ministry of the Word of God. So we're going to end it there. Let's pray out. So Father, we thank you today, God. We thank you how you ended this teaching, God. We thank you, Father, that we're in rest, that I can feel the sense of rest in us, God, that even though we're not you our usual jumping up and down and setting things aflame, God, that there's still a fire in us, but we have led us now into a place of rest where we can eat your word, where we can meditate your word, where we can take in the word, God, and we can see it in a level of rest. And Father, we thank you for that prayer that you left us with to know that we are secure in you, that we are secure with Jesus, that we're secure in you, God, and that you walk with us and that we abide in you, God, and that you abide in us and then our joy comes from within, God. We thank you for that, God. We thank you, Father, for just your greatness for your love and that you're allowing us to see you in your full form, God. That you are holy and righteous and justice, but yet a loving and merciful God, full of grace. And we thank you, Father. So, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to teach us and guide us and fill us and that tonight as we lay our heads on our pillows, God, and we sleep, that you would continue to work in us the way you do, God. That the Holy Spirit would continue to do the good things in us, God. And we thank you for that gift as well, Lord. That the Holy Spirit that lives in us, Father, that where would we be without him? Where would we be without your spirit, God? Father, we thank you for your son. We just thank you, Father, for the living works that, that he's done for the faith, Father, that we're allowed to believe that we can come into this great faith, God, and that we can fight the good fight of faith, God. So we thank you, Father, that you have bestowed that in us, God. And Father, we ask until the next teaching, God, that you will continue to show us things in our in the word, God, and that you would bring it to a full manifestation of revelation, God, and that the teacher would continue to teach us. So until the next time, Father, I ask that you would cover us and that you would continue to do your way, have your way in us, God, and that you will be in us, God. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, until the next time, we will be moving into study seven. Ooh, it knocked me off. Study seven. And we will be doing Satan's Tragedies and Attacks, part one. So. Until we meet again, good night.